Hey guys, Pastor Mark here. I'm excited to share what's coming up here at FBC. Our church-wide season of giving continues this week with the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that supports missionaries all over the world. Thank you to everyone who helped fill up our Christmas food boxes. Uh, many families all over Columbus will have a meal this Christmas because of your generosity. From now until December 31st, you can fill out our ministry survey. There are physical copies available as well as a QR code that you can scan out and fill on your phone. It's important to do so. Our Christmas Eve services are happening next Sunday, December 24th, as they do every year, at 9.15 and 10.45 a.m. as well as 4 p.m. services in both auditoriums. All of our services will be identical and condensed family services. There will be no childcare or on-site groups that day. For more info, you can go to our events page at firstgc.org. Starting on January 1st, our church will be taking part in 21 days of prayer. This will be a time where we will unite with thousands of believers around the world in a season of prayer and seeking God. You can sign up now in the lobby or at 21daysprayer.org. The FBC Marriage Conference is coming up on January 27th. Join us for a night of humor, dinner, fellowship, and encouragement. You'll be hearing more info about that in the weeks to come. Visit Next Steps if you have, or if you need more information on Jesus, joining a group, or whatever your next step is here at FBC. In your walk with God, we want to help you and guide you through it. Together, let's commit to taking the gospel down the street and around the world. Well, hey, good morning, church. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's worship the Lord. Come on, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to praise Him together. Let's sing, I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise in the valley and praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when outnumbered and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drowning. And as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to still in control my praise is a weapon it's more than a sound my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down come on and as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord oh my soul Are we ready to praise the Lord in this house this morning? I'll praise cause you saw me. I'll praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful and praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than sick. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, I'll praise cause you reign, I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, I'll praise cause you're faithful, and praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you.
let's lift a shout of praise to our God. We're going to have a time of scripture reading. If our family wants to come on up. Reading from Colossians um, chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him, all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this wonderful church and congregation. Lord, I want to pray over protection over this congregation during this holiday week. I want to pray for these uh, leaders this morning in both services, that you just empower them with the Holy Spirit to deliver the message clear and concisely. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
his amazing love. I sing, he rules. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. wonders of his love. Amen. How many of us know that he is worthy of all honor and all praise? This morning, only he is worthy. Anything else that we try to put in the place of God crumbles at the weight of our worship. So this morning, we're going to sing out. We're going to raise our voices. We're going to declare to the Lord his goodness and his mercy. Because he is good and he is worthy.
Hey man, I just wanted to share it with you guys and uh, that our gospel partners in the Middle East and that area are gathering together this morning again and worshiping the Lord. So thank you guys for your faithfulness and your giving uh, towards building that new church building as we take the gospel down the street and around the world. So thank you guys. I wanted to share that with you in some of the pictures. It's pretty cool. Um, just as a reminder, uh, today if you have any food boxes that you took to fill up, I need to bring those back today. If you have, you can put them out in the foyer and we'll take care of delivering those. We've already passed some out to schools. We're taking them to daycares. We've got several other schools. We've got families. And so uh, you are reaching people, meeting tangible needs and meeting a physical need so that we have an opportunity then to hopefully meet a spiritual need and that people who need Jesus. So thank you guys for that. Our Lottie Moon Christmas offering is continuing. $25,000 is our goal. That will go to support missionaries all over the world who are planting churches in some of the hardest to reach places like you just saw some of the pictures here and that you'll be able to support them through that. And so lots of things going on. We appreciate how you've been engaged and involved in this season of giving as we try to reach the world and our community with the gospel. Uh, we don't always get to see this, and we don't have video, but we had two people who were baptized in the other service today, so we praise God for that. It's awesome. Uh, one of them, uh, he's here. I'm not going to embarrass him, but he's a young man. His mom came uh, to church through ELL ministry, and then he participated in Upward, and so and through that, the gospel being taught, Jesus being spoken of, he put his faith and trust in Jesus, and he was baptized today as well. So we praise God for that. There he is right there. <laughs> so... And, uh, and he was on my soccer team, and so I've claimed him again for next year. I don't care what Will says, um, I will stack my team. No, I'm joking. So. <laughs> anyway, if you have your Bibles, I hope that you do, go ahead and turn to Malachi. We're gonna, uh, we started in the book of Malachi last week, and we're going to wrap it up today as we head into uh, Christmas, the time next week. And Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. If you need a Bible, uh, there's some in the seats in the back, you can turn to that. Or if you need a Bible of your own, we'd be happy to give you one. Just go back to the next steps and we'll take care of that and give you one where you can keep for yourself. And I want to remind you, if I forget after service, 
please help yourself to any more cookies and hot chocolate. And uh, stick around because we have a spe- some special guests coming. They're going to uh, sing for us today. Some of our kids and our kids' uh, choir for Christmas will be here at the end of service. And then after that, uh, we will um, pass out the prizes to the ugliest Christmas sweater. You don't want to miss that. And so I've seen some good ones. And but some of you I've seen have worn new several times, not just today. So I don't know what it says about you. So if you have your Bible, hope you do, stand up. Let's read God's Word together in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. See, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like launderer's bleach. He will be like a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then he'll present offerings to the Lord in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in the days of old and years gone by. I will come to you in judgment, and I'll be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker, the widow, and the fatherless, and against those who deny justice to the resident alien. They do not fear me, says the Lord of armies, because I, the Lord, have not changed. Your descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you how you speak through the prophets of the forecoming, the foreshadowing of what you are going to do in our lives and the promises and your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you be our teacher and our guide as we study your word, that you would challenge us and convict us, conform us more and more to the image of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys have a seat. So last week, we left off with the people of Israel questioning the promises and the faithfulness of God. It's really what the book of Malachi is all about. And so in their flesh and in patience, the people of Israel had grown very weary and they had grown complacent. See that the priests no longer looked to God in awe. Instead, they begin to see God and view him in contempt. Their sacrifices were not honoring to the Lord. They were simply just going through the motions, doing what they thought that they had to do in order to gain favor with God. The food that they left on the altar, we see, had become a joke. And they actually said, it is useless to serve God. And they asked the question, what have we gained by keeping his requirements and walking mournfully before the Lord of armies? See, in Malachi, the people of Israel believed that those who were arrogant to the truth were actually the ones to be considered fortunate. They actually believed that the people that committed wickedness were the ones who prospered and that there would be no consequences for their disobedience. These were the thoughts of the very people who had experienced God's rescue and protection time and time and time again. But instead of reflecting on their own sinfulness and their own disobedience, instead of looking at their unfaithfulness and their complacency in worship and service, they pointed their self-righteous fingers at God, and they pointed their self-righteous fingers at others. They were demanding and asking God, when are you going to execute your justice? But not according to his standards, but according to their standards. The justice they believe should be leveled against the enemies of God. And so in reality, what the people of Israel were doing, they were questioning the legitimacy of the righteousness of God. If you look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, they said, everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight, and he is delighted with them, or else where is the God of justice? I had to read that several times. I'm like, how arrogant. What right do they have? Can you imagine declaring with any sense of sincerity at all that God is delighted with those who do evil? But yet, this is what they were proclaiming. This shows a complete misunderstanding of who God is. A complete misunderstanding of the very nature of God. They're speaking against his nature. We know God is holy and God is righteous. And his word makes it very clear that he does not tolerate wickedness. He does not tolerate evil. He does not tolerate sin in his presence. 
In fact, his word makes it very clear that it is sin that separates us from God because of that very reason, that he cannot tolerate it and will not tolerate it in his presence. And yet here, look what they ask. Where is the God of justice? Where is the God of justice? And so here is God speaking through the prophet Malachi, and what he's actually doing that they're missing is withholding his righteous justice. But they didn't understand that. See, the people of Israel were crying out for justice, but in reality, God's justice requires a final sentence. God's justice results in one being declared guilty. Guilty of sin and disobedience, guilty of breaking God's law, guilty of worshiping self over God, guilty of idol worship, guilty of blaspheming the name of the Lord, guilty of lying, guilty of stealing, guilty of mistreating those who are made in the image of God either through neglect or words physically or even death, guilty of lust, guilty of discontentment. And so I'm like, do these people really want God's justice? See, they thought that they wanted God's justice, and I would venture that many of us who say we are followers of Jesus would agree with them. Man, we want to see God's justice. But in reality, what we and they and the world needs is not God's justice. We need God's mercy and his grace. What you and I need and the world needs is for God to withhold his justice, for God to pour out his mercy. That means he withholds everything that we deserve, and instead that he would give us that which we do not deserve, which is his grace and redemption. And so here is God, and he's answering the people through the prophet Malachi. And he's like, look, you're crying out for the God of justice, and I'm going to confirm I will execute my justice my perfect justice. But just as perfect as God's judgment is, his mercy and his grace are just as perfect. See, what God is is telling the people Israel through the prophet Malachi is that, yes, justice will come, but before that, God is coming. Before justice comes, God is coming. And here in verse 3, he talks about a messenger, the messenger. In this verse, we see God speaking about a messenger, but we can actually see if we break this down that the one messenger is three messengers. The first is that one will clear the way. The second is one will be the one who the people seek. And then the third will be the one that will be the one of the covenant. And so the first messenger that we see here is the one who will clear the way. It says, I'm going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me in chapter 3, verse 1. This statement is a prophecy. It's also seen in Isaiah. It's referenced in the gospel as as well. Now, today, I'm sorry, we have different scripture references. I hope I'll try to go through them slow if you want to write them down. But just to show how the Old Testament and the New Testament are so intertwined. But here we see in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, Isaiah the prophet said, A voice of the one crying out, Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our Lord in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear, and all humanity together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." And so we see through Malachi and through the prophet Isaiah that the messenger that he's talking about here will clear the way before me. This messenger will clear the way before the Lord. It's also quoted in Mark chapter 1, 1, and Matthew 11, 10. Exact same verbiage. And John 1, 23 speaks about this messenger. It said that I am a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now, if we read a little bit further in Malachi, we see a prophet named Elijah mentioned. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet, but it's evident that the messenger that that God is speaking of here is in Malachi is not specifically that Elijah. 
See, in Malachi chapter 4, 5 through 6, it says, look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Fast forward to the New Testament. There's a priest. His name is Zechariah. Zechariah has a wife named Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth. This is in the Gospel of Luke. They were righteous in God's sight. That's what Scripture says about them, that they lived blamelessly, but yet they had no children. And so while Zechariah was serving in the sanctuary of the Lord, it was his turn to take the incense in and to burn the incense in the sanctuary of the Lord. It said in Scripture that an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said that he and his wife would have a son and they would name him John. This angel said that this son will be great in the sight of the Lord. And listen, he will turn many of the children to Israel to the Lord their God. And here, here's the best part. And he will go before him. Who will he go before? He will go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah as one that is proclaiming the message of God. Here's a familiar, a familiar statement right here. To turn the hearts of fathers to their children. The very words that God spoke through the prophet Malachi, the angel of the Lord speaks to Zechariah of his son that would be named John. And he said that the disobedience and the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people, prepared for what? Prepared to see the coming Messiah. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, 14 and 15, speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus said this. He said, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone who has ears listen. And so the messenger that God is speaking of through the prophet Malachi that will clear the way was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, who we refer to as John the Baptist. It was John would be the one that would proclaim the kingdom of God has come. It was John is the one that would say the Messiah was here, that now there is an opportunity for repentance and restoration. See, John was looking for the one whom all of Israel had been longing for, the Messiah, the one that would come and take away the sins of the world. And we're told that while John was imprisoned, he sent a message through the disciples to the one that he had hoped was the Messiah, Jesus. And he asked, he said, are you the one that is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Are you really him? I think that's a question that is still being asked today. John wanted to believe. To his faith drew him to a place where he may have thought, man, this is just too good to be true. That the one that the prophets spoke of, the one all the people of Israel are looking for and clamoring for and hoping for, the Messiah, had finally come. That redemption had finally come. Jesus received that question and he instructed the disciples to go back to John and tell them what they hear and see, to testify. And Jesus said, tell John that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This messenger, the one who would clear the way, has already come. It was John the Baptist. The second messenger that we see here is the one who will be the one who the people seek it said, the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. This statement by God is actually answering the question from the people. They said, where is the God of justice? He said, I'm coming. In the original Hebrew, the first word we have see, or maybe some of your translations are a little different, it's actually one word. It's hineni, and it means here I am. And so when they ask in the original language, where is the God of justice? He said, here I am. The Lord is the one who will render final judgment on the wicked. It is God who himself will come. And see, in the ancient times, a king would send messengers ahead of him to announce to all the people that he was coming, that they were prepared to receive their king. 
And here in Malachi, we see God speaking through the prophet, God sending his messenger to prepare the way for him, to prepare the people for his arrival. And you notice what Scripture says, how he came. He came suddenly. He will come suddenly. See, 2 Peter 3.10 says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Not, not like these characters on Home Alone, <laughs> where the, the kid knew that they were coming and watched him. He will come like a thief. You won't know when he's coming, but you'll know that he's there. Unknowingly, unexpectedly. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the works, their works will be disclosed. What are the works? Wicked works. God is talking about the coming day of justice. That the king is coming, not just to bring us back to the good old days, The king is coming not to return us to traditional values. The king is coming not to just separate good from evil. The king is coming to execute perfect judgment on the world. And when he comes, there will be no partiality. The priests were known for their partiality. They would treat some people differently than others depending on who their family was or what their belief was or what was their economic status or if they were sick or lame or diseased. This king is coming with no partiality. Everyone is treated the same. And in Malachi chapter 5, and verse 5 of chapter 3, I mean, God says he will come in judgment, and he will be ready to witness against all who deny justice and do not fear the Lord. And when he comes, look at what verse 2 says. Who can endure this day of coming? Who will be able to stand when he appears? You know the answer to that? No one. On the day of judgment, God's perfect justice will be executed against a broken world. No one will be able to stand. He goes on through the prophet to describe this God of justice as a refiner's fire and a launderer's bleach. This this describes purity, God's purity, God's holiness, God's righteousness, as fire purifies and bleach cleanses and makes things white again. That's what the God of justice will do. He will be like a refiner and a purifier of silver. Love this picture. Many of us are probably not silversmiths. (laughs) But a silversmith would heat up the metal, and as he would heat it up, it would begin to, to melt. And as it melted, the impurities would rise to the top. And the silversmith would scrape the impurities He would continue to heat the silver. The impurities continue to come. He continued to wipe the impurities off. When the silversmith looked into the the molten silver and could see his reflection, he knew the impurities were gone. What a perfect picture and illustration of God. As the refiner, he refines us, he disciplines us, He removes our sin and our impurities. He keeps scraping it off. He keeps moving in our lives. He keeps disciplining us. He keeps moving us towards the direction of holiness and righteousness and his righteousness. He scrapes away all of the unrighteousness until he looks and he sees his righteous image in his people. He is a refiner and he will come with fire. See, but when the Messiah comes, the third messenger we'll get to in just a second, we won't experience this immediate judgment. See, even though we deserve it, we will receive grace and redemption. This next messenger, he's going to come to seek and save that which is lost. This next messenger, God will credit his righteousness to us. He will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and God will conform his people into the image of the Messiah, the messenger, Jesus. And see, the the God of justice is going to purify the sons of Levi. That speaks of the priesthood, and we see the priests are kind of off track here in Malachi. But one day, the offerings will be acceptable to the Lord again in righteousness, and their offerings will one one day again please the Lord. And see, what we see in Malachi is the priestly system was failing in these areas. But God's going to correct that. 
through the coming Messiah. We read this verse last week, Romans 12.1. It talks about, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, what are the mercies of God? Him withholding his justice. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And so we are to present ourselves as an acceptable offering to the Lord. That's why Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What's, God's, what's God doing? What's he up to here? He said that one day, all who are in Christ will be priests. There will no longer be a need for a mediator between us and God. This means that you and I will no longer rely on someone else making an offering on our behalf because we ourselves offer ourselves to the one who saved us. A living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Not because of anything you and I have done, but because of everything that Jesus has done, which has been credited to us. See, the God of justice is coming. God's making it very clear. Where is the God of justice? Oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. But between now and then is where we are. We are between the now, where the messenger of the covenant comes, and the then, the God of justice that they seek. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but he is patient with you not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God is not giving us the justice that we cry for because he is patient. And he is merciful. And he is full of grace. You and I have no idea when that day of judgment is coming. But you and I better not miss that we get to experience a season of grace right now. Because the God of justice is coming. But the one who will be the one of the covenant will come first. The messenger of the covenant you delight in, see he is coming, says the Lord of armies. See, this covenant is a covenant of redemption. We go all the, way back, all the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, when man sinned against God and God declared to the serpent, he, the Messiah, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. See, it was at this point in time that the sovereign, sovereign God of the universe, the creator of all things, unveiled his plan to rescue people from their sins. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see covenants. We see a covenant, a promise with, Ab a with Adam, and then Abraham, and Noah, and Moses, and David. And all these covenants were pointing to the new covenant that would come in the Messiah. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 42, verse 1, This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. The same prophet Isaiah said in verse 6 and 7, I am the Lord. I've called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you, and I will appoint you, listen, to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes and bring our prisoners from the dungeon and they're sitting in darkness from the prison house. And you know, that's Old Testament. <laughs> Look at the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 and 13. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. By saying a new covenant, he has declared, God has declared the first is obsolete, and what is obsolete is growing old and is about to pass away. This Messiah, Jesus, according to Hebrews 9, 15, is the mediator of the new covenant, so that those who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from transgressions committed under the first covenant. It is Jesus, the Messiah, according to Hebrews 9, 12, who entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. See, it is the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, to cleanse our conscience from dead works so we may serve the living God. What a contrasting picture from the priests we see in Malachi. The ones who offered the blood of only lame and sick animals. 
to offer a sacrifice that was of no use to them over and over and over again until God declared them unacceptable. And so this third messenger, the messenger of the covenant, it is the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God who offered himself as a once and for all acceptable sacrifice that would be pleasing to the Lord. Hebrews 10, 12, this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And now he's waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. He will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to all who are waiting for him. And so the messenger of the covenant of grace that God speaks of here in Malachi will come the first time to forgive sins and restore righteousness. He will change the hearts of people. He will give them new life in him. But the second time he comes, he is coming as the just judge. And here is where we see and find the similarities between the second messenger and the third messenger in Malachi. See, they are distinct, yet they're identical. It is God himself who is both God of justice and the God of the covenant of grace. Luke chapter 4, 16. I love this. this, this I've said it before. This is one of my favorite pictures and events in Scripture. Luke chapter 4, 16 speaks of Jesus. He said he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as usual, he entered the synagogue on a Sabbath day and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and the unrolling of the scroll, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it to the attendant, and he sat down. And Scripture says that all of the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began by saying, Today as you listen... This scripture has been fulfilled. I mean, I would have loved to have been there. (laughs) Not saying I would have thought any differently than the religious establishment, but just to experience that. That the Messiah had come. The messenger of the new covenant had come. See, so much happened there just in that one little picture, that one instance. We see a fulfilling of the prophecy of the, Mise- of, of the Messiah that's in Isaiah chapter 61. But notice what he told the disciples. Remember what he told the disciples to tell John? When John said, are you the one? He said, go and tell him this, that I will preach good news to the poor and recover your sight to the blind. He is referencing the exact same prophecy about himself to both John, who John would say, oh, You are the Messiah, and he's speaking that same thing to the people in the synagogue. But see, Jesus left something out here. You're like, how can Jesus leave something out? He didn't finish the quote from Isaiah. See, as Jesus read this scroll, he came to the end of it, and he said to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he stopped there and says he rolled the scroll up. The prophet Isaiah adds another sentence. And that is on the day of our God's vengeance. God is withholding his justice to give us mercy. He is withholding his justice to give us mercy. And by Jesus not reading that last little line of prophecy, which will happen, God is showing his grace before justice. And as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, Christmas is the beginning of the story of redemption. The messenger of the covenant has come. See, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 9, 6, a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Prophet Isaiah said also, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. That name should not be missed. It means God with us. The messenger of the one that you seek 
and a messenger of the one of the covenant. God with us. I want to read uh, Matthew to a couple verses in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. It's the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, good move, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Many of you are familiar in Luke with the, the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. Um, Linus made it popular in the Peanuts movie or TV show. But in Luke chapter 2, listen to what verse 8 says. It says, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Talk about being present when Jesus read the scroll. <laughs> well, being present there. An angel of the Lord came. Can you imagine what was going on all in heaven when God said, it's time? The, the Messiah was going to come. It's time. Go and tell the people. And notice what he says here. It, it, it's specific in the word. The words are important of how they're written. It says, a Savior was born for you. It is personal. That God cares for you and sent a Savior for you so you could have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life promised through the Messiah. And who's the Messiah here? It's the messenger of the covenant, the promised one. It is the Redeemer. And you'll find the baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. What an unconventional display of grace. <laughs> Through a baby in a feeding trough. Surrounded by cattle. God stepped into this world to give us grace before he brings us justice. Luke chapter 2, 25, it says, A righteous and devout man named Simeon was told by the Holy Spirit he would not die until he saw the Messiah. Mary and Joseph took Jesus to him, and looking at the child, he said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people, a Savior of the world. And indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword that will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And what God, what God said through Malachi in chapter 3, 18, he said, you again will see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and one does not serve God. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing on its wings and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from a stall. Thank God he pours out his grace before he pours out his justice. See, through the Messiah, he offers us freedom from the things of this world, freedom from bondage to sin, 
And just like a newborn calf, when a newborn calf stands up for the first time on his legs, it's like, wow, I can move, I can jump, I can run. Just like a newborn calf, we are given the legs of new life in Christ. And for once, we finally find a contentment and our purpose in him. He has given us new life. And we are like calves running out of a stall for the first time in the newness of life. The first steps in Christ. See, the birth of the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, brings the dead to life. Emmanuel brought foreigners to become citizens. And Messiah, Jesus, brings strangers to become sons and daughters of God. And so we talked last week about the 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testaments in our Bibles. I think maybe we could even say God's been silent for the last 2,000 years because he has already said everything he needs to say about grace. That Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Jesus is grace. The next time we hear God speak, it'll be the final words of judgment. But for now, he's calling us to a place of repentance, to forgive us of our sins, and to give us the promise of eternal life that we will inherit in Christ. And so the book of Malachi is a book of hope. That there's hope today because a Savior has been born for you. Thank God for his mercy and his grace. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we recognize you as the righteous King of kings and Lord of lords. You are sovereign over all things. You are perfect and holy in all of your ways. You are faithful. Your promises are always true. You have every right to do all that you do in regard to wickedness and sin because you are God. But in your great love for us, you offer mercy and grace through Emmanuel, the Messiah, Jesus our Savior. And God, as long as you withhold your justice, that day of judgment, there are lives that will be transformed. The dead will come to life. hearts will be turned to you. The hearts of a father to his child and the heart of a child to his father. So God, thank you for coming and doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. That in this time and in this place, before your final return, you offer redemption through the work of Christ. God, my, my ask this morning would be if there's any among us who have never asked you for the forgiveness, who have not received the forgiveness of their sins and the promise of eternal life in Christ, that today you are drawing them through the power of the Spirit to yourself. Today the scales are falling from their eyes and their hearts will be softened to the truth of the gospel. That you are coming in judgment. But you've already come in grace. Father, we worship you and we praise you. You alone are God and there is none like you. Father, do in our lives what we can't do for ourselves. Make us more and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus, until we are in his presence. In your name we pray, amen. So uh, we get to have a special treat. Our 
Christmas, our kids' choir has been practicing and working, and so we get to have an opportunity to hear from them this morning as they sing uh, for us, and uh, more importantly, sing to the Lord. And so as they come up here, I remind you as soon, when, when they're finished, uh, obviously encourage them, but then um, we'll have Christian come up, and he's going to hand out some prizes for the ugly Christmas sweaters. Please feel free to stick around after service for cocoa and cookies, and um, look forward to what God is going to do through us this week, and I hope to see you all back here on Christmas Eve and bring somebody with you, okay? All right. Okay, so we have another choir of angels coming in. This is the First Baptist Church Children's Choir. Why don't you give them a hand as they come forward? And they have a, a special message for you to. Uh, this morning um, as we heard Johnny speak and also this is our um, Advent candle this morning the candle of joy um, they have a special message for you no matter what happens in this world sometimes we get anxious sometimes we are stressed sometimes we don't know what's what's happening on a daily day basis they want to tell you this morning do not be afraid you know no matter what this is like all the angels coming forward to tell us don't be afraid. Don't fear. And I'm going to give this microphone to our soloist, which is Alexis Weaver, and she's going to... Life gets scary, and I feel it's worry. When fear comes knocking at my door I get upset Help me not to forget What the angel said again and again In the Christmas story Life gets scary, and I feel with worry when fear comes knocking at my door. If I get upset, help me not to forget what the angel said again and again. at 6 p.m. here. Well, that was, that was fantastic. I want to go home. You and me both, all right? Have fun, everyone. It's lunchtime, right? So, hey, 
Hey, um, we're gonna we, as we close out service. We have a lap here. We're gonna have a little bit more of a lap. Um, we've got some judges. Uh, if our judges will come up. It, we're in a Baptist church. It wasn't difficult to find some judges. Um, oh, too soon. Um, uh, and then uh, if you want to participate in the ugly Christmas sweater, you want to be recognized, I need you guys to come up here so our judges can see. We have four different categories. I don't have my phone on me. What's the four different? Five different categories. You have the ugliest Christmas sweater. Back off. <laughs> we have uh, the ugliest Christmas sweater, the funniest, the best pop culture, the least ugly and the most colorful. If you have an ugly Christmas sweater, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. If you've got a Christmas sweater on, come on. Whether it's ugly, even if you don't think it's ugly, it could win like the prettiest one. So come on up, no, back up a little bit so they can see. Back up, back up a little bit so they can see. Um, yeah. You guys are facing the wrong way. These are your judges, they're up here. <clears throat> Be judged. All right. I'll let you guys deliberate, and then I'll give it over to Christian here in a second. While they're, if I get everybody's attention, while they're deliberating, uh, tonight uh, at 6 p.m., of course, is the children's Christmas musical. We also want to remind you guys that uh, uh, the Christmas Eve service in this auditorium is at 4 p.m. next week. Um, we do have Christmas Eve services at 9.15 and 10.45, but it's just that auditorium. But at 4 p.m., we have our Christmas Eve or service over here. Just to remind you of that. And uh, our judges are delivering. So give us a few minutes, and then we got cookies, we got hot chocolate, and we'll have a good time. All right, you guys ready? I'll let Christian announce the, where's the, you want me, I'll, I'll, I can hand these out. Do you have the? Yeah. All right, now that the winners have been decided, everyone turn around to make sure that everybody in the church can appreciate who we are. I see she's lighting up back there and didn't come up to be judged. Sad time. All right, so everybody appreciate these people. Let's give them a round of applause. So what we're going to do, we're going to go down the categories, ending with the ugliest Christmas sweater. When you get picked, you can only win one time. When you get picked, you come get your prize and go take a seat. Everyone else remains up here. So, first of all, we have the funniest one. Um, this was my responsibility. I thought it was very funny. I don't know your name, but I like the fat Santa cats on, your, on yours. Is it Brayden? Brandon. Brandon, show your fat Santa cats to everybody. That is after the milk and cookies. I have the Starbucks. Here's your Starbucks gift card for an amount I didn't ask. So, <laughs> Brandon, good luck. It might be a dollar, it might be more. It could be a thousand dollars. You guys, we don't know. This could be a thousand dollar Starbucks card. It's not. Okay. All right, then we have most colorful. Now, this was a bit of a conversation, but it was one to have the most colors on it. Even though it may not be the most colorful, it's literally lighting up. So we're gonna go with Spencer's most colorful. Show us light up. Wow. He said it's a onesie. Please don't, yeah. Go. <laughs> that. All right. I have to move on from that one. Okay. The the least funny, this one was just like not funny at all. She just wore a normal white sweater. So <laughs> good job. <laughs> That's, everyone, show your normal white sweater to everyone. There you go. And good job singing. You did a good job. Go sit down. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> up next, we have the best pop culture reference. Okay. Um, the, you know, Jeanette did not do a pop culture. This is just a cra nutcracker. But there's a ballet about it. And I don't know. You don't win is what I'm saying. So Avengers down here. There's your $1,000 gift card. 
All right. You'll be surprised when there was a mess up and it actually was $1,000. All right, and then it would be a big mess up. <laughs> no one goes to camp. Okay, so <laughs> uh, the grand prize, uh, we have, how much Chipotle gift card is this? $1,000. $1,000 and a burrito blanket. If you ever want to wrap yourself up tight, I don't, no one knows. It is $1,000. Uh, 50, really? Wow. <laughs> I, I might need to revote and <laughs> see. Wow. That's pretty good. This is a good one. All right. So, the ugliest sweater. This was one that uh, personally I would love to wear because I love to enjoy ugly sweaters. Um, I, we have three glittery cats down here. Go ahead and show us your glittery cats. Can you come up to the front? She has bells and bows and glitter and stripes. This is our winner of the ugliest sweatshirt here. $50,000 to Chipotle. 50,000 pesos. We'll be taking <laughs> an offering to help. It's only like 50 bucks a business. Hey, uh, you guys have a, a great week, and we'll see you uh, next Sunday.